to welcome. My name's Mara Jean Tilly, and I'm privileged to head up the Garvin Research Foundation, the fundraising and marketing arm of the Garvin Institute of Medical Research, and I'm delighted to be your MC today. This is the second pilot of a new format that we're trialling with our virtual seminars called Bite Size Science, designed to keep you up to date on the latest Garvin breakthroughs, but free from the most modern of afflictions, Zoom fatigue. So we've got a snappy 30 minute session for you uh, and a fantastic speaker on their way. So the topic today is uh, diabetes and dementia. Type 2 diabetes accounts for 85 to 90% of all diabetes cases nationwide, and it's the fastest growing chronic condition in Australia. Quite frightening. Even more worryingly, as type 2 diabetics age, there's a staggering 60% risk of developing dementia. A devastating condition many of us are familiar with impacts thinking, behaviour, memory, the ability to uh, function, uh, the ability to be independent, and of course, most sadly for many families, the ability to recognise uh, one's loved ones. Today's Garvin speaker is Professor Catherine Samaris, a world-renowned uh, researcher and clinician in the areas of diabetes and dementia, and she'll be discussing her important work with us today. Before I introduce Cathy and uh, her stellar track record, I'd like to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which Garvin and St Vincent's Hospital are located. We recognise and celebrate their continuing connection to land, waters and culture and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. In order to keep to time, today's session will include the opportunity for you to vote on your favourite questions for Professor uh, Samaris. However, if you have a specific question that's not addressed through today's content, please do enter your question at the end of the seminar and include your name and email address so that somebody from the team can get back to you. So, on to today's star. Professor Catherine Samaris is the leader of Garvin's Healthy Aging Research Theme and Senior Endocrinologist at St Vincent's Hospital, Sydney. And Cathy also leads a significant research effort as head of the Clinical Obesity, Nutrition and Adipose Biology Laboratory. Renowned for her work in the areas of obesity, diabetes and cognition uh, and mental health, uh, another really important area, Prof Samaris has her work has translated to the establishment of obesity services at St Vincent's campus, early intervention services for mental illness and international treatment guidelines for diabetes. Catherine is an example of what is really special about the St Vincent's Hospital campus, our ability to co-locate brilliant scientists with incredible clinicians to ensure that the research undertaken in the laboratory is driven by the biggest patient challenges of the day and to make sure that those scientific discoveries can be translated back into the clinic and uh, Kathy's an incredible example of somebody doing this at the cold face as we speak. Catherine, welcome. Great to have you today. Thank you very much Mara Jean. It's a privilege to be speaking to this forum um, again. I love the community forums. This is an unusual way of doing them. Uh, normally we can see everybody and, and interact directly. But in these difficult times, uh, we will take what uh, conversations we can have with people. Agreed, agreed. And Cathy, before I invite you to share your presentation, you are without a doubt uh, one of the busiest people on, on the campus, juggling many, many hats. Uh, what gets you out of bed each day to continue grappling with these very significant health cha challenges? One of the things I really, really love about my work are the patients that I work with, and they are really my, my drive. Um, I happily get up at 5.30 every morning and um, happily um, you know, open my door at 7.30 to start seeing patients. Um, and having witnessed what people go through through illness and having walked alongside people as they go through illnesses, um, trying to unlock the mysteries of, of illness, disease, conditions, and changing those endpoints 
that I used to see um, as a medical student, that I used to see as an intern and resident, uh, that I still see um, as a consultant physician. It's really important for me that we understand the conditions that we treat and really change those outcomes so that people have the best outcomes. Just because we can prevent certain conditions from developing, and I'll be talking about that, um, but we can do a lot to also um, dampen down, ameliorate, and improve the outcomes. And that's what gets me out of bed every day, Mara Jean, that I know that we can make a difference, whether it's at the end stage, whether it's very early on, or whether it's in the laboratory, and we can um, deconstruct, unlock the mysteries and work out better ways of treating people. Wonderful. We're thrilled to have you, Catherine. Over to you. Okay, so now I will share my screen, uh, which, of course, this is an IQ test. And um, where is the share? Oh, there it is. Share screen. Excellent. Lovely. Okay. There we go, and we are ready to roll. Okay, so I will be talking to you about diabetes and dementia, and it's my great privilege to address this audience once again, and I thank Mara Jean for her kind words and for the extending the invitation to me. So how many affect people are affected by diabetes in Australia today? Well, it's at least 1.7 million that know about the condition. That's about one in 10 adults. And it costs us economically through not just health, but through uh, the impact of diabetes and its impact on people leaving the workforce earlier, being able to participate in the workforce. It's at least six billion every year. Um, and 90% of people with diabetes have type two diabetes, the, the so-called adult onset diabetes. And of those 90%, 60% of those cases are preventable. So how does diabetes make you feel? A bit like my poor little man on the low battery here. Um, if it's really early on, diabetes doesn't make you feel anything at all. But if we peel that back a bit, um, often for type 2 diabetes, we'll see this kind of body habitus. This is my beautiful David. And you can see he's, he's a little um, cherubic in the middle. And if we strip down a little further and look at the complicated machinery that actually produces diabetes, you'll see that it's an interplay where the pancreas just cannot produce enough insulin. It interacts with fat cells, it interacts with muscle and the liver. The liver is a great source of glucose. And there's um, an impairment in the gut, not just in the production of hormones like and cretins, but also in um, the gut microbiome. And all of these factors play together and explain some of the reasons why we see so many different outcomes from diabetes on different parts of the body. The eyes, for example, the feet, the liver, and of course, the brain. So what we know is that diabetes increases the risk of dementia at least two to three fold. And what I love about this particular um, slide that I've, I've got this picture is how we go through different stages before we get to the end stage of dementia, where there's a loss of so much of the neuronal tissue and so much of the, the independent cognitive thinking. And there is a stage that occurs much earlier, um, my, my sort of early autumn here, um, where people are starting to lose, lose neuronal function and have got some very mild impairments. And if we strip that back a little bit further and think about you know, what it is that um, is the link between dementia and diabetes, we can think about there being multiple different pathways to cognitive decline and dementia. We've got the classic Alzheimer's disease, and that makes up about 50 to 75% of all cases of dementia. We've got the vascular dementia side, and this is where there are blood vessel changes in the brain and loss of tissue, and I'll talk a little bit about more uh, in, in a minute. And then we've got other rarer forms of diabetes. But stroke is a very large part of the dementia diabetes rink risk link and, and for obvious reasons. I mean, you, you knock out a large part of the brain, as you can see in this here, through a clot developing in one of the blood vessels and you lose quite a lot of brain. But then there are also these um, small vessel changes that I've called here. And what I want to show you on this MRI of the brain are these 
areas with where the arrows are, these are called white matter hyperintensities. And what they show, uh, what they uh, signify are uh, changes in the very, very small blood vessels to the brain, tiny little blood vessels, capillaries almost. And these are, if you like, the irrigation system that nourish the brain. They give the brain oxygen, they give nutrients, they give um, repair molecules, they produce, they um, deliver immune cells that have repair um, functions. And so what one sees when you basically contract the small vessels supplying blood to the brain is you can see not only these white matter hyperintensities, but if you can follow my arrow, what you see here is a lot more space than you otherwise would in the brain. So what happens there is that the brain has atrophied, it has shrunk down in size. And that we know often doesn't result in a lot of functional decline, but can be a harbinger for future cognitive decline. So let's look at the non-vascular changes in the brain a little bit more. In this picture here, we have a, 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 one of these very small blood vessels that I was talking about. You've got the blood-brain barrier, which is this very, very fine lining that is, is, is an important barrier in the brain. And molecules can come through into this area here where you've got the neurons here and you can see the neurons are synapsing or developing or have links to other neurons. And then you have these astrocytes and glial cells and they basically are part of the support network. They, they might be, whilst the neurons do all of the electrical work in the brain and give us our brain function, the support of these cells happens through the microglia and the astrocytes. And in the setting of obesity and diabetes, so here we've got lots of diabetes, sorry, lots of glucose molecules coming through and in, um, pervading this space. When that happens, you end up having these cells become, instead of being nourishing, they become inflammatory and they release all of these, what are called here, inflammatory cytokines that can be damaging to neurons. And what they will do is break these synapses. It's the synapses that allow the conduction of electrical impulses through the vein and give us cognitive function. They break down um, these links, the synapses between the neurons and the neurons start to degenerate. So taking it a little bit further, what can also happen is that these, um, these inflammatory changes form what are called amyloid and then plaque. And the plaque are, are what um, the, um, the classic changes in Alzheimer's disease. And this amyloid plaque really interferes with the synapses between neurons, as you can see here. They stop the nourishment to these neurons and the neurons basically, they lose their, um, their synapses. The, sy the dendritic, the, the synapses, elements here which are called dendritic spines they start to shrink they've lost their connection and the electricity in the brain stops and that's when we start to see much more advanced cognitive decline so the net result that's what happens under the microscope but the net result we see clinically are things like memory loss changes in judgment impairment in judgment even the reduced or slowed um, thinking in the brain and altered processing and the loss of words, that, that the complexity of the language starts to reduce and long, beautiful words start to disappear and we have trouble trying to get that word. What was that word? So, a segue. Why, why is Professor Samara showing us pictures of flowers in a talk about diabetes and dementia? And this is where I want to talk about some of the research that we have done at Garvin in, in, in collaboration with the University of New South Wales and that we'll be doing in the future. So this very pretty um, mauve flower, must have been chosen from Garvin's purple, is called metformin. It's Gallagher officialis, it's, it's, it's botanical Latin name. And metformin is derived from, I'll take you to this side, French lilac. It is um, a medication we have had for over 60 years and we've used it extensively in that time to treat diabetes. So there is a lot of safety data. Because of its efficacy and its safety, we now use it in pregnancy, in diabetic pregnancy, gestational diabetes, 
but we also use it in overweight children um, and overweight um, adolescents. We use it in young women with polycystic ovary syndrome. We use it off-label to treat overweight and obesity in people who are on um, cortisone, which can, can produce obesity, and on antipsychotic medications that can produce obesity. So it has a very, very long uh, safety track record. And we were interested in looking at this a little further in one of the longitudinal cohorts that, that um, it's been my privilege to be involved with over the last 12 years. And that's the Sydney Memory and Aging Study. And these are some of the people involved in that study. The study is led by Henry Bradati and Paminda Sashdev, who some of you may know are um, certainly the nation's leading dementia researchers and they're internationally renowned for the work that they do in dementia. Um, we've been supported by a very, very strong team, Julian Trelaw and Brian Draper, who are um, psychogeriatricians that are involved in the, in the diagnosis of dementia. Nikki Koshan, who is internationally regarded for her ability to cognitively assess people, um, especially important when you're dealing with older people who um, might find it hard to do two to three hours of cognitive tests. Nikki is our go-to. She knows everything about how to assess brain function. Wei Wen, who is um, uh, Australia's foremost neuroradiologist, um, and he has done some of the very, very smart things I'm going to um, talk about in terms of uh, imaging the brain, imaging uh, white matter in intensities, looking at functional changes in the brain when we're doing MRI scans. And John Crawford, who is um, a, a statistician of vast experience and, um, and great integrity. And for the last 10 years, we've been looking at a group of people that come from Wentworth Electorate um, in Sydney's eastern suburbs, the Sydney Memory and Aging Study. And these people, there might be people amongst you have, who have been part of that study. And, and if there are, thank you so much for having been involved. The Sydney Memory and Aging Study is looking at what happens to healthy people who are in the community as they get older. And so when we started the study, people were aged between 70 and 90. Um, they would now be aged between um, 82 and 102. And some of them have even gone into um, a centenarian study um, as, as they've, because of course we're very interested in what factors might actually um, allow people such long lives. And so what we published um, only about three weeks ago was the use of this medication metformin on cognitive function and dementia as people got older. And some of you may have seen the story, some of you may have heard my interview um, with Norman Swan on the health report. Um, but uh, this is some of the data that we showed. So I'll walk you through these, these slides. This is um, our assessment of cognitive um, global cognition. It was assessed over uh, five different domains, some of those ones that I mentioned, memory obviously, using seven different tests, not just one. Um, we looked at executive function, the ability of people to make good judgments, assessed over four different types of tests. We looked at language complexity, we looked at attention and processing speed, and all of those tests formed this, uh, this global cognitive score. And what I want to show you is uh, that this group here, the, there's my cursor, there it is. The solid line here is what happens over six years to people that have average, uh, that are aged between 70 and 90 over six years. And you see a modest decline in cognition, as you would expect. People with diabetes that are not on metformin have this kind of slope. So you can see a much more rapid decline in cognition over a six year period. But if you had diabetes and more on metformin, uh, this broken line here, essentially the effect of diabetes was lost. Okay, so the rate of decline over six years in older people with diabetes was the same as not having diabetes if you were taking metformin. And I think this is a really important finding. We tried to look at this group in, in a lot more detail. Does this group have much more advanced diabetes? Were they more frequently on insulin? Did they have diabetes for a much longer period? We looked at all of those things and couldn't find any, uh, 
any such factor. It was not related to having diabetes for a lot longer. It was not uh, related to having much milder diabetes. In fact, most of the people in this group here had what we would call diet control diabetes. Their diabetes was so sufficiently well controlled, apparently, um, by their blood glucose measures that they thought that they that their doctors thought that they just didn't need any treatment at all. They could get by with diet and exercise alone. And for me, that was a very uh, rather frightening finding. It suggested to me that no matter what, uh, how well controlled your diabetes was, you should probably be on metformin unless you were having side effects to it and couldn't tolerate it. This side looks at what happened to dementia diagnosis over that time. So again, if there was no diabetes, this is this dark blue line um, here. So there was obviously because these are older people and we've looked at them for um, you know about six years there were a small number of people who developed di uh, developed dementia over that six year period if you had metformin and had diabetes then you're this um, turquoise line here and if you were not on metformin it's this uh, broken line here Okay, so you can see that people who had normal cognition at the beginning of the study, so we wouldn't have expected anybody down here to anywhere, anybody at this point here, one to two years, we wouldn't have expected many people to have um, dementia by that stage because we had chosen people who, who had normal cognition when they entered the study. But you can see the people who had diabetes and were not on metformin had a much more uh, rapid decline um, in their cognition and greater numbers of dementia. And the difference between this line here and this line here was an 80% reduction in the ca new cases of dementia occurring in that six year period. Let me now talk about an exciting new study that is starting at the Garvin um, as soon as we get over a couple of um, obstacles, COVID being the major one. So we were funded by the National Health and Medical Research Council for a five year study we were funded earlier this year, but obviously COVID has stopped um, all medical research in its tracks. It's a randomized study of metformin that in people who don't have diabetes, but they have to have cognitive impairment. And so randomized means that one person will get metformin and the other person will get a sugar pill. And it's a blinded study, which means I won't know who's on metformin and who's not nor will any of the other researchers until the very end of the study. And we'll be looking at cognitive function, we'll be looking at the anatomy of the brain, we'll be looking at the physiology of the brain, how the brain works, um, you know, how does it function under MRI when people are doing mental tasks? Where is the blood flow shifting at different times of the tasks? We'll be looking at biomarkers and genetics, and we're going to look at how metformin um, has anti-aging properties within the brain. It's an important study because it links experts across Australia. We have collaborations with the University of Sydney, the University of New South Wales, and we have a collaboration with Columbia University in New York as part of this study. And it represents a very significant um, government investment into um, healthy brain aging in this country, which is so important. So my take home messages to you are firstly, type two diabetes is preventable. There's an E missing in many people and it can be deferred in most cases. So as consumers, as patients, you need to know your glucose every single year, just as you may know your cholesterol level. Mm -hmm. Is your blood glucose normal? Is it pre-diabetic? Well, if it's pre-diabetic, we can prevent, prevent, prevent. And if you have diabetes, be very, very proactive in managing your dementia risk factors. Know your cholesterol and make sure it is perfectly low. Know that your blood pressure is fantastic. Know that you are exercising and participating in brain activity. You have to be doing all of these things. If you carry an extra five kilos, I would love for you to lose it, no matter how hard you think it is. No excuse for COVID kilos, lose those five kilos. If you carry an extra kilo, well, that's gonna to be tougher, but lose at least five kilos because even a five kilogram weight reduction will make a big difference, not only to your diabetes, but all of the cardio, cerebral and vascular risk factors. 
watch the Garvin website. Um, we will start recruiting for the MET Memory Study as soon as we get over um, some obstacles. And consider how you can help the Garvin in other ways. Um, you know, help, help our healthy ageing team extend the research that we're doing in brain ageing at the moment. Um, we are very, very interested in other aspects of brain function. We weren't fun uh, funded to do the very interesting and novel things like looking at epigenetics, looking at how the environment can change genetics um, for, for dementia, looking at how the gut microbiome can change um, what's happening for risk for dementia. We know that there are all sorts of novel biomarkers in blood, things that we can measure using novel technologies like lipidomics, proteomics, metabolomics, um, looking at diverse molecules that can't be measured in the test tube, but through novel technologies we can measure. We're not funded to do those, and obviously those things will be very, very important. So I'm going to sign off for there because I know that there are questions and uh, Mara Jean will be uh, taking over from here now. Thank you so much, Catherine. What an inspiring talk. Um, really, thank you very, very much. Now we're going to go to the audience voting on the questions. But while we do that, Cathy, can I ask a quick question? Do you predict that there will be a similar co correlation between type 1 diabetes and, and dementia or is that something we've not looked into yet? Yeah, no, there's quite a lot of data and in fact the data are a bit more worrying for type 1 diabetes because it, it often comes on in childhood. So people have a lot longer period of diabetes. People, older people with type 2, they might only have diabetes for 10, 15, 20 years. But looking at people with type 1, they may have had diabetes for 50 years. So we know also when you take insulin, you have hypos and that can increase the risk of cognitive decline as well. Okay, all right. Thank you very much for that. So audience, I hope you are reviewing the questions and, and voting them in there. Uh, I believe we've had a few additional questions come through that we won't get time to answer. My apologies, but we will come back to you with answers to your questions. And obviously today's uh, wonderful session has been recorded and will be available for you to share with friends and family shortly. Now, Cathy, you said no excuse for the COVID kilos. No excuse. Any tips on how to shift them? Zip. <laughs> so I would say if you're snacking, stop snacking. If you're having a big breakfast, well, that's good if you're ploughing fields. But if you're not, cut it by 50%. And look at your evening meal, because most of us are sitting today um, uh, after dinner. Maybe we could reduce our evening meal by 25%. Do you think that the pandemic has really had a significant impact on incidental exercise? Is that something that you're seeing in the clinic? There have been... I have been marvelling at how people have been so innovative mm -hmm. in addressing that problem. So we, a lot of people have gone to Zoom yoga, Zoom aerobics, uh, Zoom high intensity interval training. Um, and there are so many YouTubes that have popped up everywhere. So even in situations where we are confined to our lounge rooms, I have really marvelled at how so many patients, um, so many of people that I talk to, have found ways around all of those limitations. Now, we've been very lucky in Australia because we haven't had those restrictions on, on not going out. And some people have, um, you know, countries like Italy, for example, that have been contained to their, their living rooms. We've been able to get out and exercise. So I think um, there should be no excuse and we, we just need to be innovative. Love it. Thanks, Catherine. Okay, we're, um, we've got the results in. So the first question, please, is does metformin have any side effects that prevent effective treatment? Metformin can have some nasty side effects. So the main one is that people can feel quite a lot of nausea. And that often limits the dose. There is an extended release preparation that can help reduce that nausea. But some people, you wave it under their nose and they will feel like they need to be sick. So that is probably the most common and dose limiting um, side effect. Some people can't take it at all. 
Another one is diarrhea that is much, much, much rare, but it can often end a very successful relationship with metformin. People who have very severe heart failure and who are on kidney dialysis or have um, or on peritoneal dialysis, so end stage renal failure, they can't take metformin, but we can often use it to quite advanced levels of kidney dysfunction. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, how will your research impact how dementia patients are treated moving forward? So what I hope will happen from the diabetes care study that was published a few weeks ago is that if anybody has type 2 diabetes and they're not on metformin, for them to think about can they take metformin and they need to speak to their doctor about that. The way, looking forward, what I'm really interested in, this is what the Met Memory Study is all about, is in people without diabetes who are showing signs of pre-dementia, is metformin going to make a difference to them? And if it does, then that's going to be transformative because this is a very, very cheap medication. It is very, very safe. Um, some of the dementia treatments that are available at the moment on trial are antibodies, immunotherapy, with many, many side effects um, and great cost, you know, $100,000 per annum. Metformin costs $12 for three months supply. And I've talked about the side effects, but they're not life-threatening as they can be with some of the antibody therapies that are being pioneered at the moment. I'm very interested in those treatments as well. Um, but here is something that is really a repurposing of a safe old medication. And if it has benefited, I think it, it, there is scope for it to be transforming. Fantastic. Thank you. So the, the takeaway message for the audience there is speak to your doctor if you think that you would be eligible to um, try this medication. Final question, Cathy, because I know we've got to let you go. Can dementia and type 2 diabetes be prevented from early diagnosis and treatment? So certainly type 2 diabetes can be prevented. And that's why you need to know your glucose level and you need to um, have intervention, active intervention if you have prediabetes. Di dementia is about managing risk factors. So again, know your glucose, know your cholesterol, know your blood pressure and get onto it. And doing crosswords and reading the newspaper is not enough. You have to engage that brain, you have to exercise. There's some fascinating data showing that, that high intensity exercise in older people will sl slow brain aging. So we all need to be getting onto our Zoom hip classes um, and exercising hard. Fantastic, Kathy. Well, look, we, we might let you go because we know you've got another meeting to get to. You've done a marvellous presentation, very inspiring. I think we're all very excited to watch this study progress. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, to the audience, thank you so much for joining us. We are thrilled to be able to connect with you during this difficult time. We do wish we were able to do so in person and certainly there will come a time where we do do that. But in the meantime, having you here with us is very inspiring for our scientists and our clinician scientists such as such as Kathy. A special thank you to the many donors, partners for the future, board directors and volunteers in the Zoom room. We are privileged to have your enduring support of Garvin's medical research. It could not be any more critical than it is right now with COVID-19 and, and obviously the impacts uh, on, on the recession moving forward. So from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for your support. For the newcomers, we hope we inspired you. If we did, please feel free to share the link to this uh, seminar when it comes out to you. We would love for you to become an advocate for Garvin's work. And if you feel inspired and are able to, please do consider a donation to Garvin medical research. We like to try to improve in everything we do in any way that we can. So just in one moment, you're going to have the option to give us some feedback. Please be full and frank in your feedback. We're very committed to making sure that you get the information that excites you, uh, that, that motivates you and that informs you about the latest in medical research. So we'd really value your feedback. Thank you once again. I do apologise. We have run over, um, but we are looking forward to seeing you again on the 29th of October, where we will focus on rare cancers. Stay well, stay safe, and uh, as Cathy says, stay healthy and active physically and mentally, and we will see you very soon. Thank you so much.